For the bright gleam of gold, men have made many a devil's bargain, raised armies, killed innocents, crossed jungle and desert, reached even into the sea. Most famous of early salvage ships, the Italian vessel Articlio docks in England after a stunning feat. During several years off the storm-swept coast of Brittany, the ship's divers have retrieved an immense sunken treasure from a depth of 360 feet. Locked in under surface pressure, the diver was only a submerged eye guiding explosive charges or grabs lowered from above. Nearly half a century later, Jacques Cousteau and Raffaello Mancini, one of the original diving team, examine the antiquated turret now in a small museum. Signor Mancini is perfectly happy to leave the turret where it is. No, 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 no. He has no desire to make another descent. Only a dim presence in the depths, the sunken treasure ship Egypt is still vivid in Mancini's memory, recalling that the Egypt carried no less than seven tons of gold and 45 tons of silver. He identifies his own exuberant photograph taken at the time of its discovery and reports the tremendous excitement at the raising of the first ingots. <laughs> Today, salvage often has a more urgent purpose, tries to protect a more valuable commodity, life itself. Each day brings word of new wounds upon our habitat. Industrial wastes are dumped into the sea, Another ruptured tanker spills its oil. Off the boot of Italy, a ship collision sends a deadly cargo of tetraethyl lead to the bottom. There are the customary public assurances minimizing the threat of the chemical an anti-knock component added to high-test gasoline. But in California, a marine biologist describes its level of toxicity. Concentrations as low as one part per billion result in death or abnormal development in a third of the organisms. As you can see from the microscope, tetraethyl lead is an extremely toxic compound. A sea urchin cell disintegrates after exposure. I think we just arrived in time to avoid a catastrophe, a big ecological catastrophe. Too slowly. Man is developing methods to protect himself from poison cargoes rusting in the sea. Sometimes, struggling in the dark, it is easier to pretend the danger does not exist. Hidden in the depths, the deadly threat is uncaring. But it is there.
For Otranto, the sea brings few surprises. Like a man and a bad-tempered wife, they have lived together at least 2,000 years. Lying at the easternmost tip of the heel of Italy, the town is the first to feel the blows of Bora, the Adriatic storm. There have been other storms. A dozen conquerors have come this way. Greek and Byzantine, Arab and Norman, Spaniard and French. 12,000 died during the siege of the Turks. The town has learned that in crisis, some men panic and some find a courage they never knew they had. As after a slight pause, Otranto resumes its ordinary life. Women go to pray, the streets are swept, old people stir to relieve the stiffness in their bodies. No one is surprised to see a familiar figure. Cousteau has been here before. Again, I am in Otranto. I walk with the cathedral's priest, Don Quintino, and talk of another threat, silent and invisible, that ended a few short months ago. He tells me that the incident of the sunken ship, the Saftat, is a reminder of our sacred mission to protect the wonders of God's creation. Around us, the children wheel like birds, going about the most important job in the world, growing up. I asked them about the soft A few have forgotten, but most remember. Oh yes, it is the ship that sank with the poison. Already, it is a piece of history. The present is more interesting. Later, I walk with the hero of this battle, Judge Alberto Maritati. Without him, many things would not have been done. The Saftat anchor would not now stand in the port as a reminder of what might have happened. As a souvenir, I give him a copy of my magazine article, which first drew public attention to the self-tat. Beyond us, beyond the port, the sea seems no different. It is still one of the busiest corners in the world. Here, between the Adriatic towns and a hundred ports scattered about the Mediterranean and beyond, an endless procession of ships passes to and fro. Quickly, I go backward in time to that day in the summer of 1974, when here, in calm seas, the Yugoslav freighter Saftat was rammed by an Italian-owned Panamanian ship and sank in 50 fathoms of water, barely three miles off the coast at Otranto. At first, the judge merely makes a routine inquiry. Then comes word of the Saftat's potentially lethal cargo. 300 tons of tetraethyl and tetramethyl lead in drums that one day will corrode and spill their contents into the sea. Troubled by laboratory reports on the poison, Judge Maritati sends telegrams to the Merchant Marine and other ministries asking what action they plan to take. There is no reply.
He now sends urgent messages to public health, justice, the police headquarters, even the Senate. Again, there are only vague, evasive replies or no response at all. To Cousteau, Maratati relates that after endless maneuver and delay, he has taken independent action. For the first time in legal history, he sequesters a wreck on the sea bottom. Finally, in January 1977, he orders the Saipem Company to begin salvage at an ultimate cost of over $12 million. Within a month, an extraordinary task force of recovery vessels lies in place above the wreck, ready to begin operations. Though greatly helped by Cousteau's efforts to focus attention on the threat, the flotilla has been put there mainly by the will and courageous action of one man, a mere provincial magistrate. Encouraged by the Italian government to study the operations now underway, Cousteau arrives on the Calypso. Attaching a line to the Castoro, a Saipam recovery ship, he joins the anchored fleet. Later, with salvage company officials, he welcomes Judge Maritati aboard. At launch aboard Calypso, Judge Maritati again emphasizes the crucial importance of public concern says he hardly could have taken any of his actions without the public support, largely aroused by Cousteau's article and the subsequent decisions of tourist organizations to boycott the area. As the first jurist to have sequestered a wreck and its surrounding area on the seafloor, Maritati now prepares to set another legal precedent. In the Calypso's diving saucer, the Suku, he will be the first magistrate to descend into the sea to view legal evidence and draft a deposition. Monitoring the descent, Cousteau keeps steady contact with Falco, operating the Suku. Approaching the wrecked Savtat from the stern at nearly 100 meters of depth, the judge glimpses the barnacle encrusted object of all the legal maneuvers and orders in his three-year battle. Out of the gloom, the lights reveal a troublesome specter. The ship's cargo mast, half broken and left askew by the collision.
on deck and in the holds of the soft top, death waits in orderly rows. 900 drums of tetraethyl and tetramethyl lead. Again, Cousteau discusses with Falco precautions against the hazardous current, which sometimes reaches five knots an hour around the wreck. Though the ship has settled upright, almost as if still sailing on the surface, the accident also has scattered some drums about the bottom. As the sukup again nears the surface, the diver attaches a hoist line to the capsule. Lifted aboard the Calypso, Judge Maritati emerges from the hatch of the Suku to receive congratulations for his unprecedented mission beneath the sea. His long battle for action has triumphed. What now remains is the difficult and exacting task of physically bringing the poison drum safely to the surface. An essential first requirement is the removal of the damaged cargo mass, leaning precariously over the forward hatch of the Sabtat interfering with the removal of drums from the hold and endangering the divers. Arriving at the Castoro's helicopter platform, Cousteau is astonished by the scale of the Saipem operation. Led by Falco to the main deck, he finds himself in a huge, clamorous construction yard. Flat bottom, nearly 500 feet long and 100 feet wide, the Castoro is as large as many stadium playing fields. With its giant derrick capable of lifting 800 tons, with its smaller mobile cranes roving the deck like strange beetles, the Castoro is one of the most advanced undersea recovery vessels in the world. Yet all this is necessary for the exacting requirements of the depths. Close by, the Calypso seems slim and small. Even on the scale model used by Francesco Lo Savio to describe the relative positions of salvage ship and wreck. A diving specialist, engineer Lo Savio, is in charge of all the Castoro's underwater operations. That such an accumulation of equipment had been necessary. Uh, here we have a beautiful model. Uh, it's that is a motor ship, Yugoslavian flag. Mm -hmm. uh, 3,000 tons of cargo on board, comprising uh, 900 drums of uh, antinoc compound. Later, Lo Savio and Eugenio Silvestre, surface supervisor, describe topside operations.
Through the control modules, communication systems, the divers are monitored almost continuously. Center of the recovery effort, they require 150 specialists, doctors to crane operators, to keep a single diver working below. About to enter the compression chamber that will be their home for the next three weeks, a fresh team of divers joke with Falco about their monastic isolation from the everyday world. Storms may come and go at the top, they remind him, but it is always calm below. Watched by Bernard Delamotte, Calypso chief diver, the team settles into the deck chamber, part of the totally enclosed system known as saturation diving. In it, the divers are kept continuously at the precise pressure of the depth at which they will work. The pressurized bell or compania, which will take them below, is rigorously cleaned. A single microgram of lead can render it unusable. In the diver's quiet, detached existence, reading, listening to music, playing checkers, even the arrival of a meal or a snack is an event. Upon their welfare, Dr. Mario Milanese keeps a strict paternal eye. Each day, divers and chambers are rigorously tested for signs of possible contamination. Twice weekly, aided by specialists from Optel, manufacturers of the tetraethyl, samples of blood, urine, and breath are checked in the laboratory for possible traces of lead in the divers' bodies. Dressing for the dive is an elaborate procedure. Because of the frigid temperatures at 300 feet, and because the heliox mixture removes body heat through the lungs, a hot water circulation system has been incorporated into the diving suits. As the Campagna is brought to the chamber and attached, its inner pressure is equalized with that in the living quarters. From one of the cranes, a four-ton counterweight is now lowered to the forward hatch of the south dive. The two support cables will serve as the guidelines on which, despite the currents, the Campagna will descend and rise, much like an elevator, between Castoro and the wreck. Still in the compression chamber, the divers take final precautions, drawing on a double set of gloves to protect them against the poison drums below. At last, they transfer to the Campania, the narrow world in which they will descend. Detached from the chamber, the divers wait as the double hatches are closed. At the bottom, only one will emerge to work. The other will remain inside as sentinel, ready to communicate with the surface in event of mishap. And in the control module, Cousteau suddenly remembers the experiments that made saturation diving possible at all. I see again the old surrealist images, bizarre figures seemingly in torment. Actually, it is quite simple. 
were testing the responses of divers after prolonged submersion at various depths. After living one week at 35 feet of depth and working several hours each day at 85, Albert Falco and Claude Wesley solve underwater puzzles with the same efficiency as at the surface. It is 1962, the first of the Conn Shelf experiment. Less than a year later, in May, June, and July of 1963, for Conn Shelf II, we build an undersea village of prefabricated houses on Shabrumi Reef in the Red Sea near Port Sudan. With Falco, I arrive in the soucoupe at our undersea garage. Then we swim to the so-called starfish house on the upper slope of the reef. Here, six oceanauts live for a full month at 35 feet, working each day at 85. Because there is a limit to the amount of respiratory gases absorbed by the human body, saturation divers may work for extended periods and still require only one decompression. The parrot is both friend and guarantee against deterioration of the breathing mixture. Like the divers, the bird adapts readily, seems little surprised to find itself in a world of fish. Lower on the slope, two oceanot neighbors leave for a week at 90 feet, working as deep as 330 feet each day. For the third conch shelf experiment in July 1965, a large checkerboard sphere is towed into the Mediterranean near Monaco and lowered to 335 feet. Here, living on food rendered nearly tasteless by the helium, six ocean notes remained for 27 days. Swimming each day to work on an oil rig mock-up at 400 feet, following the air tubes home through the blackness, like some deep sea Ariadne's thread, they prove that men can work in the depth for prolonged periods with no ill effect and no loss of efficiency. I remember them, the air umbilicals that brought them life in the depth. Because of them, Castoros divers can do their work. Aboard the Castoro, Silvestri describes the Campana's much advanced life support system. The, uh, electricity, telephone, and hot water for the hot water. Hot water. <laughs> Watched on the television screen by the chief diver in the control module, the team in the Campana goes over its final checklist. Dei 
slowly then as the great winch unrolls the umbilical cables for telephone and lights, for heliox and hot water heating, the capsule descends. In the dark, cold solitude, 300 feet below the surface, the Campana halts at the counterweight. Now dressed in white plastic coveralls for visibility and protection against the poison, the diver emerges while his companion watches from the bell. Followed by a camera, the diver explores the forward hold. Everywhere, the impact of the collision has scattered debris. Even after it is cleared away, the drums themselves will have to be extracted laterally by an elaborate pulley system to a point directly beneath the lifting cables. To the surface control comes a request from the diver. To correct the angle of a cable, Castoro must be moved several yards to the east. Obediently, the 18,000 ton vessel obliges. Warily, the diver swims among the drums. Some are bent, perhaps ruptured. Not only outer rust, but inner corrosion threatens to spill their contents into the surrounding sea. Diver's hand brushes the rust from a poison label. But it is not rust. The drum is leaking. Suspecting that he has been contaminated, the diver swims back to the counterweight. established procedures. He removes the white plastic coverall and gives a degree of protection to his diving suit. Leaves it outside on the counterweight before entering the bell. Later, at the disposal yard maintained by Octel, the white plastic suit, like all other exposed materials, is burned under the supervision of the manufacturer's masked personnel.
Though partially protected, the diving suits and masks are also rigorously scrubbed and sanitized, and the Campania is carefully decontaminated. The diver indeed has suffered a mild contamination. By televised observation, questions over the telephone, and blood samples passed through the airlock, Dr. Milanese has diagnosed the diver's symptoms and ordered him to bed. Se, esatto, vero, tu mi fai il cenno affermativo, pensavo anch'io di dare a... Having already administered antibiotic and cortisone pills, he now prescribes medication for the remaining skin irritation. Questo era il mio problema, però io gli rifilerei senz'altro anch'io il Bactrim. There will be no ill consequences, but without all the precautions, there could have been. Laden with poison drums, a basket is brought to the auxiliary ship, the Orsa, specially fitted to handle the tetraethyl. With vents placed high on the sides, any leakage of the heavier lead will be trapped in the bottom. Detected too late, the poison from a ruptured drum spills into the sea. An urgent reminder of the need for haste before other corroded drums release their contents into the currents below. In a press conference on the deck of the Orsa, surrounded by the perilous evidence, Judge Meritati tells reporters that the next step is to fix responsibility for the accident. Whether either of the two captains involved was guilty of negligence. The charges, destruction of a ship and of marine life. Despite increasing concern for the decaying drums, bad weather is a routine disturbance. Yet some preparation goes on. Helped by the Calypso divers, new lights are fixed for the work below. Laboring alone, as always, for the four to six hour work period, the diver enters the forward hold. Amid the pieces of litter not yet cleared away, he loops cables around the drum one by one. And at last, by pulley and crane, manages to maneuver them into one of the baskets waiting alongside the Sartat. Each basket is raised to a level some 60 feet below the surface. There, a service diver swims down to meet it. A 
attaching a new slack cable that finally will draw it upward, not to the Ranyo, but to the Orsa now standing by at the surface. Performing a totally separate function from the diver's ship, the Orsa comes to the site only when sufficient baskets have been filled to make a cargo. Donning masks and decontamination gear, the octel technicians on board the Orsa prepare to accept the accumulated drums. Again and again, the procedure is repeated. Day by day, week by week, the work of retrieval goes on. Delayed by rough seas or dangerous surges in the currents below, the baskets somehow are filled, the cables are attached, and the orsa receives another basket of the sinister eggs. At last, aboard the orsa, a foreman signals a hold. Its cargo is complete. As the Orso once again heads back to port, specialists begin the delicate task of siphoning the tetraethyl and tetramethyl from the individual drums. The chemicals are then transferred to the much larger storage vats, in which finally they will be returned to Octel. As each drum is drained of its contents, it is carefully resealed, then added to the rows of cylinders already empty. Later, they too are loaded into great containers to be taken by truck to the octel incineration yards and there finally burned. November 1977, the last basket of drums is brought to the surface. Gusteau and the men of the task force celebrate their triumph. At a cost of $14,000 per drum, after 10 months, 270 dives and 1,200 working hours on the bottom, all but less than 3% of the poison has been recovered. Oh. 
But where are the missing divers, Cousteau asks, then remembers they are still below. Heroes of the occasion, they are not only late for the party, it will be another five days before their decompression is completed and they can emerge again into the ordinary world of other men. <laughs> By then, the party will be over. But tonight, at least, Otranto is without fear. Judge Maritati set legal precedent. He also proved again the power of aroused citizens, requiring governments and technologies to serve basic human need. That as in Otranto, old women may talk quietly with God in candlelight, that men and women may work in love, that children may sleep, believing that tomorrow the sun will rise and the earth will still be green. Thank you.